Welcome to Passing the Plate, the podcast that's all about food, traditions, and the incredible connections they create. I'm Ashley Covelli, the food writer and recipe developer behind Big Flavors from a Tiny Kitchen. And I'm Lisa Listen, the genealogist and family history expert behind Are You My Cousin? We are your guides on this flavor-packed adventure. We're not just talking about recipes. We're diving into family history, exploring new cultures, and preserving favorite recipes for future generations. In short, we're celebrating the stories and tastes that come with every bite. So grab a seat at the table and let's head out on a journey of flavor, tradition, and connection. This is Passing the Plate, where every episode is a feast for the senses and a celebration of togetherness. In today's episode, we are tapping into two of our very favorite topics, food and games. We're going to play some food trivia and discuss how playing games can actually bring a little fun into the kitchen. Well, you know, Ashley, genealogy research is really a bit like a game as well. It's, I consider it the world's largest jigsaw puzzle out there because you don't really know what the picture looks like, but you also have to go and actually find the pieces. So and well, sometimes the pieces go missing as well. So it's just like having that that jigsaw puzzle on my, my dining room table. I don't always know what it's going to look like. And well, until I get to the very end, I'm really not 100% sure all the pieces are there, quite frankly. Well, here's a question for you regarding puzzles, since now that I, now I know you like puzzles. Do you do the edges first, or do you go chaotic and just go with whatever? Because I know there's like two very different schools of thought there, and I haven't done enough puzzles to really have a stance one way or the other, but probably edges for me. All right. Well, there's no chaos involved. I will say that. I <laughs> typically, I will typically do it by sections. So for me, I'm looking at a color or I'm looking at um, pieces that are similar and I'm working in sections that way. But sometimes occasionally I will do the edges first. But just because I don't do the edges first all the time does not mean there's chaos. It is a very <laughs> intentional um sorting that I do to make sure I'm, you know, going to get it right. I did I did see the most chaotic puzzle ever at, at a, a bingo event I went to. One of the puzzle or one of the uh, prizes was the world's most difficult puzzle. It was all white. It was that's just, just no white. Fun. Yeah. That's it's that's evil. <laughs> I want to have a shot at actually finishing the puzzle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, do you have an example of a time you were stuck in one of your genealogy puzzles and managed to find your way out? Oh, absolutely. I probably have too many of those, and some of them I haven't found my way out of. Actually, to be <laughs> honest, to be totally honest. So, yeah, um, some of my early research had in, was into um, one of my great great grandfathers. His name was Will Haley, and I couldn't really figure out who his father was. Because in genealogy research, if you haven't done that before, we we need to go generation by generation. You don't ever want to skip around the generations because you're going to end up related to people, well, that you're not related to. So you want to, you know, take it each generation step by step. And I had seen a lot of stuff out there, on you know, that people were suggesting who his father was. But well, just like when I look at puzzles and I think that doesn't quite fit. So I don't really think it's a match. It was the same thing. I really was like, I really don't think his father is this man over here. It just there's just something about it that doesn't fit just right. So I really just kind of took a, a step back and, and got a different perspective and went searching for more puzzle pieces to his life. And sure enough, I just did one little quick uh, search for his marriage record. And when you know, guess who, who was mentioned on his marriage record? It was his father. So that was a really quick and easy way to actually disprove who his father was not, and who his father was. So it was one of those kind of early, it was very early in my research, and it was a very standard search. But at the same time, for me, it was something that I had to sort through and not really trust everything that was out there. I had to look behind um, the puzzle pieces, so to speak, and see and really start to sort it out. So it was, I, was, I was thrilled. It was one of my first really big discoveries. That, and that really does speak to the way that you mentioned that you do puzzles. You, you you start with the one color area before you just go off to another one. So, yeah. You're getting a glimpse into my brain. Getting, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so in my profession, when it comes to food, I like trying to sneak in games and trivia whenever I can, which is why I pitched this episode idea to Lisa. <laughs> um, and she was fully game for it. See what I did there? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I've come up with several games between the classes I've taught and just, you know, doing things in the kitchen with my own family that's brought some kind of 
either a gaming aspect into it. Um, one of those is like a mystery box or chopped challenge. If you've seen the show, are you familiar with the show Chopped? I am. Um, I know. I have seen. Yeah. It. If if any of you aren't, it's a it's a cooking contest. There's usually I think four chefs, and each of them gets a mystery box with a certain number of ingredients, and they have to incorporate those ingredients into a, an appetizer or an entree or a dessert. I think there's three rounds, and the ingredients are often weird or they seem like they don't go together. So it really kind of challenges their creativity in the kitchen and problem solving. So at what that's looked like in classes for me, um, I did this with a group of teens at the library several years ago. We gave everybody the same ingredients in uh, grocery bags tied up so they couldn't see what was in them. Or maybe we had, actually, I think we had like a couple, uh, each one was maybe different. You could do it either way, really. But they had a, a certain amount of time, and they had to come up with something creative with those ingredients. And I think we let them have one veto. So, you know, it might have been, like, peanut butter, black olives, you know, just, like, random things. But people can get really creative with this stuff. Um, at home, a way that I've I've kind of made that into a game is occasionally I'll tell my husband and my son, go put together a mystery box. And then they'll tell me how many vetoes I can have. So if they pick like six ingredients, I can have maybe two vetoes. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually put the results of some of these on my website. Um, the first one I did involved chorizo. There was I, there was chickpeas. There was pickled okra um, and bee pollen, which seems crazy. But I actually really liked what, what ended up coming out of it. Um, another time, some other food bloggers and I, we each sent some random ingredients to each other in the mail and we all made dishes out of our ingredient assortments um, just to see how we could get them to work together and it's interesting if you have the same ingredients as someone else seeing how completely different you could go um, and if you have different ingredients just seeing what they come up with out of what you gave them um, but it's a great way to use up like random ingredients I think my, the the chorizo one I think my husband picked that because it needed to get used soon or, you know, if you've got like half a bunch of cilantro left or, you know, it can be a, an interesting way. And also, if you have kids especially, I think they enjoy the opportunity to maybe um, try to stump you. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say how much of that was part to stump you as well. But I, I like that. I like this idea. When you were describing it, I thought it's kind of like when I go to my refrigerator at the end yeah. of the day and I have no, you know, I haven't figured out what I was going to like. Sounds like, you know, <laughs> I've been doing my own mystery box challenges and yeah. didn't even know it. Well, and putting together, I feel like using leftovers is, is a great example of that. Like sometimes you can repurpose them into something new, like a bowl is a great way to do that. If you've got some leftover um, cooked protein or grains or beans or veggies, um, you can kind of make it work in a bowl a lot of times. So and then it doesn't taste like the same thing you had, like maybe you had made uh, like chicken enchiladas and you had a little bit of chicken filling left and then you had some pickled red onions from something else or some salsa or some rice like you could kind of turn that into something different um, and it's a little less boring that way and it helps eliminate Definitely. food waste which I love yes um, <laughs> me too <laughs> another another thing that I've done is um, I did this with a class recently we did a cheese and chocolate pairing so a lot there's a lot of like wine and cheese pairings but cheese actually works really well with chocolate um, so you could do a pairing event. It doesn't have to be cheese and chocolate. It could be whatever you want. But if you put together, like if you were having people over and everybody could have the same tastes of the same things, and then you have little sheets that tell you, you can write your notes on it. So maybe you'll find your next favorite cheese or chocolate or, you know, wine or whatever it is that you're tasting. Um, and if you're looking for some examples of things to note, um, for my cheese and chocolate pairing, I had, you know, for each one, write down the type of cheese. Anything you notice on the appearance, like does it look a certain way? Like what's the color, um, the aroma, anything that you smell that's different? Get that initial flavor, any notes that you notice like, oh, is this tangy? Is it really sweet? Um, so I did that for both the cheese and the chocolate. And then I had like ratings. So one to five, how do you rate this? individually and then as a pairing and then any extra notes that you have so it's just kind of a fun way to explore and the people um I did that with one of the local libraries and they had a blast with it and it was interesting to see um 
the favorite pairing from that event was a was sharp cheddar and dark chocolate with raspberries. Oh, yeah. I yeah. guess I wouldn't have thought about that. Uh, yeah, it was it was really good. <laughs> it sounds so, it sounds delicious. It's it's I, I love all three of those mm-hmm. uh, flavor profiles. So yes. Yeah. Um, another thing that a friend of mine did years ago that I thought was really fun. She did a blind wine tasting event where they bought all these different bottles, different price ranges, and then they put little, like, not little dresses, but like something on them to cover so you couldn't see the bottle. And they were mm-hmm. all numbered. And so everybody had to guess which one they thought was the most expensive and the least expensive. And whoever guessed right won some sort of prize. Um, but you could figure out which ones you liked best. And then at the end, they revealed like, well, actually, most people liked this really cheap bottle of wine. And the people who think they know a lot about wine, maybe they don't. Or um, So just kind of a fun way to, I don't know, just to change it up and and help you not be led by price as an indicator of quality or mm-hmm. the label as an indicator of quality. Um, so that was that's another thing that I think could be fun. And it doesn't have to be with alcohol. You could do that with anything. You could do that with cheeses. You could buy mm-hmm. like, I'm not going to say like a craft single and then like a cloth bound cheddar, but you know, you could do right. something with different price ranges for anything really. And it's a good way to really to, to try different things that you might not otherwise try. Exactly, exactly. And if it's a tasting and you don't really particularly care for one of them, you're just having like little bits, so it's okay. And you can probably find someone else that'll be like, I will take that extra blue cheese off of your plate because I enjoy it, you know? Um, And then the last thing that comes to mind talking about like games in the kitchen, and I'll put a link to this in the show notes. This is something I came up with in the pandemic times. (laughs) Um, It was the Adventurous Eaters Challenge Kit, and it was geared toward kids and it's an email series that when you when you sign up, you get an initial packet um, and then emails once a week for I can't remember how many weeks. Um, but it's something that me and my son came up with together. And one of the things in there is an adventurous eaters bingo. So there's different ideas for you to help. It was the whole idea was trying to get kids, but honestly, adults, too, <laughs> but to get kids to be a little more adventurous with what they're trying to eat in the kitchen. So some of the examples of the, there's a free space in the middle because it's bingo, but um, find a fun new shape of pasta to try. Bake something new and share it with a friend. Um, Eat a leafy green. Visit a farmer's market. Have breakfast for dinner. So some of, they're like different levels of difficulty to like get the spaces. Um, Try a new condiment. Uh, set the table for mealtime. So once the idea being once they get a bingo five in a row across up and down or diagonal, they get like some sort of reward Um, and just kind of encouraging them to be more adventurous that way. Um, And I even made a little like flavor profile page so um, the kids could fill out my favorite part of playing this bingo game, a food challenge I have for other kids to try, new things I have tried my current favorite foods and a food I still don't like. And then a new food challenge for myself. So just really trying to encourage like spending time together, getting, making it less like scary and intimidating to try new things. And Mm -hmm. honestly, gamifying things is just fun. I mean, for, I think so. (laughs) And for kids. (laughs) I agree. You know, you can actually gamify genealogy for kids as well. There are, um, there are games out there where they'll have like, you know, do you remember the memory card game that we would play as kids where you put down cards and you have to match? Yeah. Do you just flip over? They actually have those. Um, people can send in, I, I believe they still do this. You can get, send in like your information and you can create, get some that are created based on your ancestors. Oh, that's of things. Fun. Or there's a lot. Of, I've seen games too where, and for family gathering family history, maybe, you know, there are always funny family photos out. So they might, try, you know, caption this photo type of thing. So there's lots of little games like that that can be played when it comes to um, family history. It, at reunion, sometimes people will play family history bingo. Again, oh, I love that. They'll create their own cards and eat or and, and do the bingo. So you have to, you know, match your ancestor to whatever it is they're they're calling out and do it that way as well. So there's lots of different ways to do that, both for children and for adults to kind of get them interested because really family history, not everybody's interested in family history. I can't imagine really. I just can't imagine, but it (laughs) happens in the world. 
And oftentimes when I talk, you know, my family will ask, you know, what are, what have you found? What have you, and as I start to share, I, of course, I'm going to go too deep into the conversation and their <laughs> eyes just sort of glaze over, right? Because they're really not asking for it at that point. So it's really, I really try to find ways that make it fun to be mm. able to share the information, but also to get the information. Because remember, at the time, I'm still trying to get uh, more information on my family. And so I always am looking for puzzle pieces. And I think I'm always on the hunt for puzzle pieces to my family history type thing. And um, I think you and I have been talking and we've, we did an episode, uh, the last couple episodes kind of focused on some of the coffee um, aspects of food mm-hmm. because you and I are both such coffee drinkers. But honest, I think really a, co- a cup of coffee is really can really be the best genealogy research tool or family history tool in that toolbox that you have as you go looking and trying to gather because we really need to gather our family stories. And this is, I will tell you, actually the most overlooked step in genealogy research. People want to jump right into those databases and it's fun. It's easy. And and sometimes it's quicker, but it's the stories that I personally love. And you're never going to find those stories on lawn. You're not going to find those stories and you're not going to find those clues for your family history puzzle. You're not going to find out that, you know, the the ancestor that you always knew as Bunny, well, I can guarantee you her records are not under the name of Bunny. They are under her real name. And so maybe you don't even know her real name. So yeah. we have to be able to look for that. And um, so that's the, fu- that's, to me, that's part of the fun thing about genealogy research is I look for those puzzles, but just having a conversation and making those connections um, over that cup of coffee can be invaluable. I the think other- my- Oh, so I was going to say, I think my husband has run into a couple of those instances of everybody knew this person as one thing, and he's been diving into his genealogy and family history. Um, His family's from Italy, and just he's been discovering some really cool things. And there's some, for sure, there's been some relatives that maybe they didn't know that this person remarried or had another family, or we all, you know, everybody thought that so somebody was named this, but it was really that. And that's when you really unlock a lot of stuff. So that is, I guess, pretty common. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, because that's the one thing I think we, we tend to forget is that our ancestors were humans. And just as, you know, the weather affects what we do in a day or the type of occupation that we do affects where we live. It's the same thing for our ancestors. They, they might've had different influences, but definitely there. And, you know, it was very easy also for them to change a name. I have a great grandfather who changed his name. From what we understand, he simply just didn't like his name. And so he changed it. And I it's thrown. I cannot tell you how many researchers out there it has thrown. They re- they see my family tree. They reach out to me. I'm like, trust me, it's the same person. And the only reason I know is because his son told me. My grandfather right. told me. I mean, and the family knew. And then when you line it up, absolutely, you, you can tell. It. When you know what you're looking at, you can see where the pieces fit together. But, yeah, and you didn't, I mean, it's not a legal thing. He didn't have to go to court to do it. They just did it. Yeah, <laughs> a lot, a lot so. less steps to make it happen back then. Definitely. But it brings up another thing, too. Not only do people have the, could change their names or go by nicknames, certainly, but spelling people don't realize when they go on the family hunting for their family history is that spelling i won't say it's irrelevant but it it, there are a number of variations for spellings on surnames on first names because spelling really wasn't standardized until well into the 1900s at least here in the u.s and so i mean i have surnames that you know i think i've researched my my maternal side of the family and the surname is howard well I have seen a half a dozen different spellings for everything from, you know, H-O-W-A-R-D, the very traditional spelling of Howard. Well, I was excited to learn that, oh, wow, look, the name used to be Harwood, H-A-R-W-A-R-D. Oh, wow. And, that, and that's a big difference when you're looking at yeah. the records, right? And so I didn't know, you know, did I have two families, one family? So I sorted it all out was so excited to realize, oh, wow, look, I did it. I you know, realized that this is the same family, but the name, for whatever reason, changed. We don't know why. Um, I think it was just some kind of natural evolution of the name, I suppose. But I presented it to the family. I'm like, guess what? Look what I found. Do you know what they said to me? They're like, we didn't tell you? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, what? You knew this all along and you did. Well, okay. In all fairness, I never asked what the name right. was. It didn't occur to me that there was a different name. But 
<laughs> so, so if I, but if I had had more conversations and taken the time to really pursue some of the history, the clues were there, the signs were there, I would have saved myself a lot of research time in the records. So I always tell people, you know, make sure you're not overlooking your most valuable asset. And then, you know, if you are the oldest generation, that doesn't preclude you from asking your your relatives. Mm-hmm. You've got to go why. Go to those second cousins, those third cousins, because those family stories are different on each side of the family. Perspectives were different. Lisa, one of the things when you were talking about um, the games that genealogy related that you could play i have an idea for you if you're looking for one the sure. game came to my mind so you remember the game guess who mm-hmm. i've seen custom ones that people will do with characters from tv shows and stuff or whatever fandom um like it'd be really fun to do like a gilmore girls one i've seen a, a drag race one mm-hmm. um but you could do that with family members so you could have pictures of your ancestors and you could somebody shark tank this and then like give us some of the money from it but <laughs> you could um you could do pictures of your ancestors and then, you know, d- the question that you ask to try to eliminate, it could be like, did your ancestor grow up in whatever state? Did your country? Does your, an- does your you know, there's all those questions you get to do. They wear glasses, but just it could be appearance based, but it could also be like if you know something about this ancestor, um, it could be a good way to get some conversations going. Oh, I think it's an excellent way to get conversations going. I could see that really doing well at, say, a family reunion. It's a great yeah. idea to do for a family reunion where you can have multiple generations that you know could even mm-hmm. team up together. Yeah. Or even like taking photos of the family that's still alive and with us and at the gathering to make a version of it. I mean, it could be, mm. oh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential there. I just love it. Hmm. Side business. <laughs> Are you worried your family recipes will be lost to time? Imagine generations gathering around your family, sharing stories, and enjoying dishes passed down for years. With the Passing the Plate video webinar and ebook bundle, you can make that happen. You'll learn how to capture those cherished recipes before they're lost from memory, uncover the secrets and heartwarming stories behind each dish, and connect you to your family's history in a powerful and delicious way. To learn more, head to passingtheplate.org forward slash resources. Okay, so Lisa, yes. are you ready for a little bit of foodie trivia? Oh, let's do it. So I'm going to be reading some questions. I, I have not pre-read these to her, um, but I'm going to be reading some questions from this game that I have called Foodie Fight, a trivia game for serious food lovers. It's kind of like Trivial Pursuit. It's super fun, and this game, um, I've had it for several years now, and it's special to me for a little more reason when my father-in-law, when he was real sick and in the hospital, me and him both loved food and watching food shows. So I would bring just the trivia cards from this game to the hospital while he's waiting for tests and in and out and everything. I would ask him questions, and it just kind of kept it interesting. We would we would test our knowledge while we were hanging out. And I sometimes I wouldn't look at the answers, and we'd both try to figure it out together. So, mm-hmm. um, Okay, so if you're playing along at home, you can tell your own points and let us know if you... Uh, how much, how well you did on this. Okay. True or false? We'll start. You're going to have a 50-50 shot here. It takes about three pounds, 1.3 kilograms of wild fish to grow one pound, 455 grams of farm-raised carnivorous fish, such as salmon. I have never heard a fish called carnivorous. I mean, I get it. I've just never heard that term in relation to a fish before. Have you? Um, no. But... <laughs> like if I think of carnivorous fish, I'm thinking of a piranha. I know. I'm thinking carnivorous. I'm getting out of the ocean. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let's let me let me take out some of the words of that. True or false? It takes about three pounds of wild fish to grow one pound of farm raised fish. I'm gonna say true. You are correct. I got one. Yeah. Oh, and let me quickly the categories on this game. There are one, two, three, four, five, six different categories. So that was from the category lab and field. And the description of that category is cooking science, nutrition, and food production. But the other categories are foodie sphere, food people, world cuisines, and food places, food stars, food online, on film, and in print, music, and art, companies coming, which is party planning, table etiquette, and beverage and food pairing, dining out, which is eateries, chefs, menu matters, and restaurant service, and then what's cooking, cooking techniques, tools, and ingredients. So they really kind of stretch the gamut. 
Um, okay. What Mexican sauce is a complex combination of chilies, ground seeds, onions, garlic, and chocolate? Oh, I know this one. Mole sauce. Yeah. And they even give you a pronunciation because it's spelled M-O-L-E, which a lot of people seeing for the first time would say mole. And it says mole. So, <laughs> well, you know what? Yeah. I learned to cook. I actually, um, my husband and I were on a vacation one time and we were we took a cooking class with in, we were in, I think it was Cancun, and at the, we were at this woman's house, and she, we we were the only ones, I guess, who signed up that day, and we actually made mole sauce. That's why I knew what it was. I mean, it was amazing. I'm sure. How how involved was it? Because I know a lot of them use a lot of ingredients. It was a lot of ingredients, but I don't think it was. I, it, it, did, it wasn't hard. I mean, right. the technique wasn't hard. It did have a lot of ingredients to it. But she's like, "Oh no, we'll do it. Let's do it." So, oh, that's yeah, amazing. That was, do you really have fun. that recipe? I don't know if I still do. I'd have to, I'll see if I can dig it up. But I do have photographs of it. I do yeah. Have well, of it. if you find the photographs, definitely let's share them in the show notes. And if you find that recipe, definitely share it at least Will with do. me. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Um, what was the title of food lover Nora Ephron's film about Julia Child and a food blogger? Um, oh, okay. So it was Julie and Julia. Or maybe Correct. it was Julia and Julie. Uh, Julie and Julia. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Um, and it says, released in 2009, it was Nora Ephron's last film. She was director, screenwriter, and producer. See, now should I try to... Should I try to stump you? Here's one that might be a little bit... A little bit trickier. Okay. What is the name of a wide, traditionally ripple-edged pasta that translates... Translated means gulp down. I did not know that this is what this word translated into. Is it long or is mm-hmm. it short? Is it like, it's like a lasagna noodle? No. But that's a good guess because those are traditionally ripple edged. I, so I, I have this other one in my head, but I can't. Um, I don't. It's, I don't know. It's pappardelle. And this pronunciation says pa par delle. Oh, right. Pa par delle. Pa par delle. Okay. All right. Oh, I didn't know um, that. You tell me when you want me to. I will keep asking you questions. This will be the longest podcast in the history of podcasts if, if you <laughs> leave it up to me. How, you are tell me on t- how are we on time? I didn't look. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. How many have you asked me? Three, four? You asked me what, four? Like four. Want to go for another two or three? Sure. Okay. Uh. Let's see. Where do U.S. diners make the most food complaints and leave a third of what's served untouched? That's a good question. I'm going to have to say school cafeterias, but <laughs> no. Um, oh. I, mm, maybe like a buffet type style? Hospitals. And actually, um. interestingly, when, so I had, um, interestingly, I had an appendectomy during the pandemic, which was terrifying, but um, the food at the hospital was incredible. And they actually, this hospital near me, they got a new chef who had like, I can't remember if he had worked somewhere that had Michelin stars or something crazy like that, but they said that it's worth the hospital upping the quality of their food because even... Like, that's something that's the m- most memorable from your stay and will leave the impression on the hospital is how the food is. So I thought that was interesting. Oh, absolutely. Because I, I used to work in hospitals in my former career. And, yeah, we, you know, I worked in hospitals. They would have chefs, you know, the chef who was in the kitchen and, you know. It, but it makes sense, too, because in the hospitals, oftentimes, you know, people's medications can affect and illnesses mm-hmm. can affect taste buds. So I can definitely see why that why we get that answer that that they say yeah. um, well and i wonder what percentage of those complaints were um from the staff of the hospital because they're not sick they're just there every day working that's a good point you that's know a good point yeah <laughs> all right let's do you up for one more one more let's go one more all right how about you tell me which category you want so we've got foodie sphere food stars companies coming lab and field dining out or what's cooking let's do companies coming okay companies coming which generation is most likely to love hosting parties at home? Millennials, Gen Xers, or baby boomers? Baby boomers. 
millennials, according no to way. an allrecipes.com 2016 trend report. Really? This game is a you know, and I technically, I'm I'm what's considered an elder millennial. That's my generation, though I do very much relate to Gen Xers, my husband's Gen X. But um, yeah, I love hosting Interesting. A so I'm actually, I'm not a baby boomer, but I'm also none of the others either. So you're <laughs> like a really cusper? Know. Huh? Are you like on the cusp of two? I'm at the tail end of the, I mean, I think I'm a year or two after baby boomers probably. Yeah, but, so then they would call you, would that be, because like they call mine an elder gen, or sorry, elder millennials, which just makes you feel ancient that they use the term elder with it. But it's because we're just like those first couple years into that right. new generation. I have no idea what I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I hope that wasn't too, too painful for you. I, I love trivia. That was good. I confess, I was a little nervous going into that thinking, uh-oh, I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> You can check out some of our favorite food-themed games and the results of Ashley's Mystery Box Challenges over on the show notes page at passingtheplate.org forward slash 10. Well, that's a wrap on this episode of Passing the Plate. We hope you enjoyed our journey into the world of food, traditions, and the amazing connections they create. As always, it's been a pleasure sharing these delicious stories with you. Remember, food is more than just sustenance. It's a way to connect the dots between our past, present, and future. And until next time, happy eating, happy connecting, and pass the plate. Head to passingtheplate.org forward slash podcast for show notes. 